Father, I pray that you would open our understanding in the Word of God and speak to our hearts, draw us closer to you today, and may we seek your face. In Jesus' name, amen. A reading of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles is essential to every Christian's education. The stories are vivid, places they're violent, they're filled with bright hopes and they are filled with ominous signs and warnings. It's the record that takes us from the days of Samuel who anoints Israel's first king, Saul, over them all the way through the destruction of the first or the northern kingdom and then the destruction of the southern kingdom. So when we look to Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, we are looking at a period of history that takes us, walks us through kingdoms in decline, cultures that cave from the outside in, that literally fall in on themselves. And from the halcyon days of David's early reign to the story of God's grace to a nation in constant decline, ultimately to the statements of and the carrying out of God's judgments. But we need to know the Old Testament. Some folks have decided that they can relegate it, they can push it to the side, that it really doesn't speak to us today. And we need to understand that the Old Testament is the storybook, it is the, it's the picture book, it's the illustration that speaks to New Testament truth. That the Old Testament is not just valuable, it is essential to our understanding of the plan of God and the purposes of God. We don't need less of the Old Testament, we need more of it. We need a deeper understanding of it. For in the Old Testament, we see portrayed God's values. We see portrayed God's mercy and His grace and His judgment. We understand. We understand who He is by knowing not only the New, but the Old Testament also. The Apostle Paul cited Old Testament precedents as master examples of the nature of God and the certainty of His rule of righteousness and His unchanging standard of holiness. Paul consistently cites the Old Testament and he's not alone. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul cites the wilderness years and the failure of the Israelites as rather than entering into God's promise, they wandered around because of their own sin. He cites that whole thing and he says to us in chapter 10, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians, now all these things that happened to them, they happened as examples and were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages has come. Understand, Paul was not merely reaching back and saying, here's all of the stuff that happened and I'm going to use that to illustrate my point. No, Paul says all of these things are given as an illustration for us on whom the end of all times or the end of days has come. The Old Testament stories speak to the present hour. The Old Testament is that vivid illustrator of the new. So in 2 Kings 22, we find one of Judah's greatest kings so grieved, so appalled, so troubled, that he tears his own garments. This is not without cultural precedent. It's very much a part of the culture. As you walk through the Bible, you'll see this happening time and time again. It was within that culture, it was a physical outward response to circumstances that were truly horrible. Truly horrible. When Jacob received the lies of his sons who came back and told him that favorite son Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. They deceived him with the, with the coat of many colors that had been dipped in blood. They put that in the hands of their... Can you imagine a more evil crew? They put it in the hands of their father and they watched as their father Jacob, hearing, hearing that his son was dead, he tore his robes. It's the sign of ultimate grief. 
In 2 Samuel, David was informed of the death of Saul. You'll remember that David had opportunities to kill Saul, to do him in, to take over the kingdom. David had an anointing and a call on his life, but David would not take the place of God. He would not touch Saul. And the fact that God had anointed Saul and the, the fact that God's hand was upon him, David, when he heard of the death of Saul and how Saul had died, was absolutely, he was absolutely appalled. And he tore his robes. Just a few chapters later, in 2 Samuel, David receives news that his own son, Ammon, has brutally murdered his brother, Absalom. And he tears his garments. In Job, look at the book of Job, and all of these terrible things happen to Job. And when the culmination of it all, when, when the death of his children is communicated to him, Job tears his clothes. Joshua, after the conquest of the land of, of, of Canaan, Joshua leads them with that triumph in Jericho where God knocks the walls down and they march right into the city and, and it's a sign that God is giving them the land. Here it is. This is what they've waited 40 years for. It's now being delivered by God and yet in the very next campaign in taking the land that God had promised to them, the very next campaign at Ai, they went down in a sure, certain, and bloody defeat. And Joshua, recognizing that there was sin in the camp and that God had withdrawn His powerful hand and had allowed judgment to fall on them, Joshua tears his robes. Under the rule of, actually the wanton rule of a high priest named Eli who gave his evil sons power within that priesthood. Israel was at war and his sons, his sons took the Ark of the Covenant with Eli's knowledge. They took the Ark of the Covenant and they marched off to battle with the Ark of the Covenant, which was symbolic of God's pre His literal presence among the people. And they took it not understanding truly the power of the Ark of the Covenant or the covenant that had been made with God. They took it as though it was a magical talisman. They took it as though it were a, a good luck charm. And they said, surely if we go marching in with the Ark of the Covenant, God will not let this Ark be lost, so He'll give us victory. And it was an evil, it was an evil and corrupt gesture on their part. And Israel fell in battle that day, and the Philistines, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. Eli is sitting outside watching to hear news of the battle, to see how it's going with the people. And as he's watching and as he's, he's waiting and, and as, as he's ready to hear, here comes a man running. And as the man gets close, Eli knows something's desperately long because the man has torn his robes. And it's not just that the house of Israel had lost in the field of battle. When it was stated to Eli and the Ark of the Covenant has been captured, when that word was spoken, Eli fell off of his chair, broke his neck, and was dead instantly. Because of the absolute horror of it all. Tearing one's clothes is a sign of mourning, catastrophe, disaster. It's the outward sign of an inward humiliation of the soul. It's brokenness. It's not this. It's grief. It's grief. Josiah's story is a little different than the mourning that we usually find in the Scripture. It's different than the mourning over the death of a family member or an army in, in battle or the loss of, of life. His mourning was not for the loss of life on a battlefield or some natural catastrophe. His mourning was that the Word of God was so utterly lost to the people and to himself that to the moment Shaphan read from the book of the law, they didn't know what it said. A little bit of background, Josiah, this who he really becomes a wonderful king, this young and this wonderful king, is the great-grandson of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is one of the most noble kings in all of the Bible. Josiah is the grandson of the next generation. That would be the generation of Manasseh. And Manasseh goes down as the most evil king to ever reign. Evil, 
vile, wicked, horrific. And he had a long reign. And Israel followed their leader into incredible depths of depravity. And of course, in that situation, the religious life of Israel was diminished to the point where it was only formed. The house of God falls into disrepair. And what God's Word actually says is an absolute mystery to the people because they are living completely pagan lives. There's a temple that stands in the midst of their city and they have no concept as to what the temple is really all about or what the book of the law. They don't even know that there is one and those who do know that there is one are not absolutely certain as to what it says. All of that under the wicked reign of Manasseh whose son Ammon Ammon follows him to the throne. But Ammon is on the throne for only two years and he was so wicked and he was so evil that his own servants put him to death. Josiah at this point is eight years of age. He becomes a regent king. And he is raised up. Something was printed on Josiah's a sense of righteousness somehow had been instilled into this boy because the cycle that had existed for those two generations for almost 50 years is broken as he begins to seek after the Lord, desiring God's will to be done among the people. Josiah stands out in all of the kings. He stands out as this bright light in the dark decline of Judah. A half century has passed since Hezekiah's righteous reign when Josiah comes on the scene. But in less than 50 years, Judah has fallen to such a state of spiritual decay and wickedness that the book of the law has been lost, it has been forgotten, not just in the culture, it's been forgotten in the temple. It's been forgotten in the church. It's been forgotten in that temple, that marvelous edifice that had been dedicated, remember, dedicated by Solomon. And when the temple was offered up to God saying, this will be your house of dwelling, you will dwell among your people, we will walk according to your covenant, we will obey your laws, God answered from heaven and sent fire down to say, I accept my dwelling place among men. And then you have this magnificent conversation between God and Solomon where commitments are made. If you follow what God says, if you'll follow after my will, if you'll do this, this, and this, I will bless you accordingly. But if you do not, then these things are going to happen. It's, a mar it's just a marvelous passage of Scripture. It's, a, it's an incredible conversation between God and, and Solomon. You remember the, the words that God spoke? He said, if you fall and if you stumble and if you run away from me, if you will return to me, ultimately, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and, listen, heal their land. It's a magnificent promise. It is in that very dedicated temple that no one has any clue or idea as to what the book of the law says or even where it is. And so we have this very strange circumstance because you and I, uh, the problem that we have is we read, we read through um, Samuel and Kings and Chronicles and we condense, we condense it all, story to story to story to story to story. We don't see it. We really don't see it in the span of more than 300 years. I'm sorry, almost 450 years. We don't, see, we don't see the history unfolding, and because we condense it, we see these stories all kind of folding in on one another. But there's an, a tremendous element of time that pulls all of these things together. And so we look and we say, how in the world did they reach a point where the, the book of the law has been lost the book of the law has been ignored. No one really knows what's in it or what it's all about. When it is discovered, when it is discovered, when Hilkiah the high priest says, we found something here to Shaphan the scribe, who then, this, this expert in matters of law, goes to the king and says, we found a book and I've read it. Which is more than we can say for some folks these days. We've got a book here and I've read it. And now I'm going to read it to you, and he begins to read it. It's 
a discovery like an archaeological find. Don't miss what the scripture is saying here. The word of the Lord had been lost. It had been lost in the culture and it was lost in the temple. The two are not unrelated. There's not a greater illustration or indication that a people have lost their way than the violation of God's word in the culture coupled with the ignorance of God's word in the church. This is absolute surety that we are headed for a low, low moment. When God's word, when God's word is violated in the culture and either ignored or a subject of complete ignorance within the church. Hosea was the last prophet to speak. He was the last prophet to speak to the northern kingdom of Israel. Understand that when after Solomon, the, Israel was split into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern. The northern had a capital in Samaria. The northern ten tribes had their capital in Samaria. The southern tribes, two of them, were in, they were known as the tribe of Judah. Uh, or they were known under the kingdom name of Judah, two tribes. But they were in the south and their capital was Jerusalem. A lot of confusion in the Old Testament for people because they're reading about kings and prophets and they don't take the time to sort it all out and say, okay, this prophet was prophesying in the northern kingdom to a northern king and this prophet was prophesying in the southern kingdom. Uh, for instance, Hosea was a prophet in the northern kingdom and he was prophesying at the very end just before the destruction of the of the northern kingdom but uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah they were southern kingdom prophets and so that you often when we're reading the Old Testament we get it all jumbled and we look at the kings and say I can't make any sense of this and we have to kind of draw it out and, and understand we're dealing with two different kingdoms as Israel has been torn apart and in 722 BC the northern kingdom was completely destroyed by the Assyrians utterly destroyed but before the northern kingdom fell and the northern kingdom led you remember a king named Ahab and his wife Jezebel you remember them because they were evil and they did evil in the land you remember that there was there was this ongoing conflict between Elijah and Elisha all of that's taking place in the northern kingdom Hosea comes at the end of this whole prophetic period and he speaks to the absolute declination the the absolute destruction that he sees in the the northern kingdom he says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge they're destroyed for a lack of knowledge they do not understand who God is or what he has said the northern kingdom disappears literally it is it is flattened and destroyed 722 BC the southern kingdom known as Judah followed the same sinful course. She outlasted her northern uh, sister by a mere 138 years. And you would think that after what had happened in the northern kingdom, and you would think with the publication and the, and the voicing abroad of what the prophets had spoken, you would think that the southern kingdom would have responded by turning to God. This was simply not the case. And it is within that context, within those 138 years, we're looking into this 50-year window between King Hezekiah and the emergence of Josiah. This is the window of time we're looking at. How could it happen in Judah, having witnessed the complete moral and monarchical meltdown of her sister to the north? How could the book of the law be utterly forgotten so much so that when Shaphan, the scribe, reads of the covenants, the king's reaction is the ultimate expression of shock and of mourning. He tears his clothes. See, Josiah was raised in a culture that had turned its back on the law of God. Josiah knew little more than who God was. He knew very little of what God expected because he was brought up in the aftermath of 50 years with Manasseh and Ammon. He'd been brought up in a culture that had literally imploded on itself. It was coming apart at the seams. The core was melting down. And in the midst of it all, here comes Josiah. Hezekiah's reverence to the law was long forgotten. Generations have short memories. We have very short memories. 
We get used to living how we're living. We as Christians often have very short memories when it comes to God's Word. A lot of folks right now, the only, the only words of the Scripture that really appeals to them are the ones that apply to their specific situation or their circumstances. The idea of going to God's Word and plunging the deep well of, or plung, plunging into that deep well of God's Word, looking for the historical precedence, that's, this is absolutely beyond them. Their memory is only as old as their latest need. And whatever the Scripture says to encourage them, we need to know, we need to know the Lord's Word. Josiah knew little more of who God was, not so much of what God expected. And absent a moral law, it was, coming, it was just coming apart at the seams all around him and he didn't realize how bad it was until someone stood up and said, this is God's covenant. These are the words that are recorded. This is the book of the law. This is what God expects of us. And he tears his clothes. You see, absent a moral law, the world does not become neutral. I'll say it again. Absent a moral law, the world does not become amoral or neutral. The world becomes immoral because man is not a moral being. He is a sinner. Uh, and for some folks, this is really problematic because they say, I just think we need to think the best of, of everyone. And I'm, I understand exactly where you're coming from, except you need to understand that man, every one of us, is a sinner in need of the grace of God. We have all sinned, come short of the glory of God. There is not one of us righteous, no, not one. We have a bent towards evil and left to our own devices. We will go after evil every time. And without the moral restraint of God's Word and His Holy Spirit at work within us, we are absolutely lost. Except for, except for the grace of God that we receive through repentance, we're hopeless. We can't be good enough. Not one of us can be good enough to save ourselves from our own sins. And so man, in, in the loss of moral law, man does not become neutral, he becomes immoral. In the absence of boundaries, we will rapidly descend to deeper, deeper, darker levels of evil. God's Word that is lost now for 50 years in Israel, disregarded for 50 years in Israel, has been replaced by a paganism, by idol worship by altars of sacrifice built all the way around this. You have a city that has Solomon's temple where the fire of God once come, came down. It is literally ringed about by all of these altars on the hilltops. And if you've ever stood there in Israel and you've looked out, you can see the hilltop all the way around Jerusalem. And all the way around Jerusalem on every high place there is an altar to some other filthy and pagan god. Listen to what the Scripture says of Josiah's great-grandfather, Hezekiah. It says he trusted, 2 Kings 18.1, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor were there before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him, and he prospered wherever he went. Second Kings makes it so very clear to us that this, Hezekiah's kingdom, this was a kingdom at the apex. This was a kingdom on the rise. This was a kingdom where righteousness was proclaimed. But all it took to foretell the destruction of Israel was the abandoning of the Word of God and the abandoning of moral law. The embrasure of sensual values and the ready participation, approval, and promotion of immorality by leadership. That's all that was necessary to completely destroy the work of one of Israel's greatest kings. The horrible truth of the matter, Josiah's awakening and reforms, you can read it in the rest of the story. The bottom line is this, his of reforms, and there were many, but his reforms, they were too little, too late. 
while he outwardly, Josiah, this good king, outwardly reshaped the nation and he instituted reforms and he tore down altars and he, he got people moving in the right direction at least for a season, the hearts of the people were ultimately lost. And when Josiah's own son succeeds him, when he died as a young man and his own son goes to the throne, the Bible says this of his son named Jehoahaz, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. I have to understand the power, the power of a sinful generation and its influence in the generations to come. The price of wickedness is paid out over generations. Over generations. What kind of a nation are we leaving for our children and grandchildren? Our first president, George Washington, said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Washington. He was followed by Adams, the second president of the United States, who went further than this when he said, we have no government armed in power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the governance by any other. Modern times, not so, long, not so long ago, not so far over the hill here in America when Calvin Coolidge was the president, he made this statement from the office of the president. He said, the foundation of our society and of our government rests so much on the teachings of the Bible it would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings should cease. And we look at what has happened in America over the last 50 years. The Word of God has been increasingly driven out of public life. Statistically, one of the most dangerous places to be today in America is in a mother's womb. Because of the rate of abortion, and I recognize that abortions are going down, and I thank God for every bit of decline that we might see in this wickedness and evil, but the bottom line is it is still statistically one of the most dangerous places to be today in America. All this within a 50-year window. Our institutions of higher education, once dedicated to biblical values, and so many of the prominent ones were founded upon the Scriptures and for the declaration of God's moral law. During the Enlightenment and into the 1800s and early 1900s, these universities that once stood as bastions, as, play, as fortresses for the absolute moral truth of God's Word, one by one have fallen away to the point where biblical values have been completely cast aside. We have shrouded them in scorn. I don't have it with me this morning, but you can go back, you can search it on the internet, you can look at the original charter of Harvard. You can even look 50 years, 70 years, 100 years into Harvard's history and you will be literally shocked to find out what they say in their founding documents as far as who they are and what they stand for and what the basis of education is. It all started with the Bible and it is all, it is all gone. Our politicians have violated every biblical restraint on borrowing and spending until we have now become a debtor nation lacking the fiscal discipline or political will to leave anything whatsoever to our children. Of their inheritance, we can simply say this morning, we have spent it all. Just this week, our president made public his approval of homosexual unions. And many in the church celebrated the corruption of what God has instituted, the sanctity of marriage. They celebrated. I am not here as a proponent of political parties. You, 26 years I've ministered in this congregation. You know me. Those of you who have been here for any amount of time, you know I am not a political rabble-rouser. That is not my heart and my passion. I am a proclaimer of the Word of God. That's what God has called me to do. That's where I limit myself in these things. But brothers and sisters, there simply is no biblical cover for the sin of homosexuality in the Word of God. There is absolutely no divine approval for sexual immorality of any stripe. The Bible no more, the Bible, the, the Bible no more, 
The Bible no more approves one level of sexual, you know, of sexual impurity o- over another. Th- throughout the Scripture, there is a consistency everywhere we look. In the, it simply does not change. The Old Testament is consistent and insistent of the abominable nature of all sexual impropriety, but it speaks specifically to homosexuality. The New Testament echoes the same Paul directly addresses sexual sins and homosexuality he he doesn't assign as being special over any of the others, but he certainly points it out in his letters to the Romans and also to the Corinthians. And you have to gut the letters and destroy their context completely to negate the arguments that Paul is making. In Romans chapter 1, as Paul speaks of God's wrath being outpoured on all unrighteousness, In speaking about how God's wrath is coming on all unrighteousness, he speaks with stunning clarity. He says of those who are leading nations into unrighteousness and people who are walking in unrighteousness, he says, professing to be wise, they became fools. And I want to pause for just a moment, for we have this idea that the higher we rise in our educational achievements, the wiser we become. And the two are not necessarily related. We are educating ourselves, as Malcolm Muggridge said, no fool himself, as Muggridge said, we have educated ourselves into imbecility. There is absolutely nothing so vile that can be proclaimed in the nation anymore that will not find proponents within the university system to defend. It's not an ed- it's it's not that we become more educated and the more educated we become we become more wise. Paul says professing to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. Now he speaks of idolatry into an image made by corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them over to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. For this reason God gave them up to vile to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use For what is against nature, likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men and women, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty for the error of their due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. This is exactly what the office of president has approved this week here in America, which is why I stand here today, and if I had a robe, I would tear it. Please, I I just, I everything, no, please, please. The, everything in the fabric of my being resists this us and them thing, and I just, I do not want to be, a, I, I appreciate the support, but what happens so often within the body of Christ is it becomes us against them, and before long it's, it's all about, about winning, and, and brothers and sisters, I think our hearts should be broken today. I think that we should weep today and moan and groan today. I think there is nothing to applaud I think our hearts should be so bruised and so wounded. I think that we should be looking at this and saying, Oh God, if you don't help us as a nation to restore our shattered foundations, if you don't help us, what will become of us? For we have approved now those things in direct opposition to God's Word. God's Word has become lost in our culture. That's a surprise to no one here. But it's become lost also even within the church. Don't we know these things? Have we not heard? Haven't we read? Have we never studied? Have we, ever, have we never really opened the book? Or have we taken a, Jefferson, a Jeffersonian approach? 
Have we taken the Bible as he did? He figured himself to be a man of the Enlightenment. He considered that they had, had just through the Enlightenment, they had, had risen to a new level of intellectual understanding that had to be done with all of the superstitions of the past. And he was offended by the Bible and by its supernatural nature. And so Thomas Jefferson took his Bible with a pair of scissors and he cut out all of those passages that were supernatural by, by nature or that he did not uh, see as agreeing with his own ethic. He formed his own Bible. It's called the Jefferson Bible. You can get yourself a copy today where he cut everything out of it that is supernatural. There's no resurrection. He carved it up. And brothers and sisters, we are doing the same. We are doing the same. We're cutting out those things or we're interpreting away those things that we're uncomfortable with so that we can ultimately arrive with a document that means nothing. For its basis has been utterly rejected. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul said, Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators. Lest you think we're teeing off on one sexual sin here, there are a lot of them, and all of them are out of bounds as far as God is concerned. But he said, Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you are washed, but you are sanctified. You are justified in the name of Jesus, of the Spirit of our God. This is the Word of God. This, this is our foundation. At Calvary Church, when you go through a membership class here and we explain and we teach doctrine, make it very clear that the very first doctrine that we are established upon, number one in the reading is this. We believe that the Scriptures, both Old and New Testament, are verbally inspired, not just the ideas, the very words, are inspired by God and that they are the revelation of God to man, His infallible and authoritative rule of faith and conduct. This is basic theology 101. And if any of these scriptures I have shared with you today, if any of these scriptures are new to us or unknown to us, or if somehow we have reinterpreted them to make what is unrighteous now righteous, those of us who claim to worship in spirit and truth, I can only assume that God's word has been just as lost in this church as it was in the temple in Josiah's day. While we have, may have some inkling of who God is, we have absolutely no understanding whatsoever of what he has said. And we are welcoming in, we are ushering in, and even celebrating the days of Manasseh. When Josiah heard the reading of the book of the law, he was grieved and he tore his clothes. So how do we respond to an embracing of any perversion of God's moral law? Will we celebrate or will we just sigh or will we just shrug our shoulders Will we adapt our morality to fit immoral times? Where is the grief? This last week, uh, the, the marriage amendment was a huge deal. And I would, have, I, I would have made mention of it last Sunday morning. I flew in at the end of it, got up on Sunday, and, and I, was, I was going to mention it. not going to bring out the guns or anything, but I was going to mention it. And just, it completely got past me. But on Tuesday, we went and voted and, and affirmed the uh, this, this marriage amendment uh, for, um, for North Carolina, the thing that grieved me the most, the thing that grieved me the most was the, the overwhelming at times response that I saw coming in from social media and a number of different areas where the whole thing came down to this. Those who were on the, 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 the side of the amendment for the amendment, they were, they were just so excited because they won. It was all win-lose. Brothers and sisters, if what took place here on Tuesday, if it wasn't about values, if it was first and foremost about winning and not about a statement of value, then the heart's wrong. And we need to do some soul searching. It becomes, it, it becomes to us this great contest and we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. And, our, and in the midst of all of that, while we're high-fiving, the world is going to hell and we need to understand that our hearts need to be broken and grieved. And how can we speak the truth in love when we're doing our victory laps? We need to be very careful and 
I'll, you, you can throw me out if you want. I'm going to be your pastor and admonish you this morning. I want to speak to you just about being so very careful about what you do with all of these wonderful media opportunities that we have these days with social media, with emailing. They're wonderful, wonderful tools, but there is absolutely, there is absolutely no substitute for you and me meeting face to face as people who may have disagreements and talking with one another where we can see each other and know one another's hearts. Email and social media, I'm telling you, it is fraught with difficulty in these areas. And what we do is we quickly draw up these lines where the discussion declines to a point where it is no longer even and Christian. You got something against me as a pastor? Do not, please, do not, I beg you, don't send me a three-page email. You don't even have to buy, come have a cup of coffee with you. You don't have to buy the cup of coffee. I'll buy my own coffee. I'll buy yours too. But email's a lousy way. It's a lousy way to communicate and sometimes it's sometimes. No, I'm not even going to get there. I'm just going to leave it alone. Is there no grief? So our hearts need to be broken, and it's only out of broken hearts that we can love. And when it's all about we communicate the wrong message. And though we might, though we might take great comfort from a sense of being right, we can be so desperately wrong at the same time. What is, are we okay with that? I'm your pastor, and you know, I, I, I just feel like we need help along these lines. We need help a lot. And I'm a, I'm a Facebook user, and I'm a, I'm a massive user of text and email all the time. I'm not anti-technology. I'm simply saying when it comes to issues that are going to draw us into emotional places, we really need to be sitting down with one another so that we can know hearts in the matter. Because the language that comes across these media is so incredibly dispassionate or passionate as the case may be. See, we... What is, is morally wrong in America cannot ultimately be fixed in the White House. It can't be fixed in the Congress or the Senate. What is, what is so often what we think is if we, can, if we can do this, if we can get this, if we can seize that, if we can have, if we can have all three and the Supreme Court, if we can have four, all of it covered with people who are just like us, we will bring in a righteous rule and reign in America, and we are wrong if we think that's the answer. All of those may be good things, but those are not going to be the ultimate answer. Josiah occupied the highest office in the land and held in his hands powers that politicians today can only salivate over. He possessed incredible power, unknown unknown within the political arena today and how did he do well he did very well he did very well he worked very hard he gave himself fully to trying to reinstitute righteous rule and reign in Jerusalem but the exercise of his authority could not at that point turn the hearts of the people And it's not misplaced for us to say we need to be involved and we need to do this and we need to, none of those things are misplaced. However, if our hope is based on anything less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, if we don't recognize from the very beginning that it's all about dealing with issues of the heart, before long we're going to be running down a rail going someplace we never imagined we'd be going. You see, we possess, we're blessed, we possess what generations before us did not possess. Peter and Paul didn't possess what you and I possess. Peter and Paul never had to register as voters because there is no such thing as a vote. You stopped and considered that in the Bible? Very few cultures have ever been given the opportunity you and I are given to have even that, even that small of a voice. In, in so many ways, we are so incredibly blessed. Didn't exist in the days of Rome, but we have a vote given our rapid moral decline, given the, the continued ascension of immorality, we need even more than the vote. 
Your pastor, I'm telling you this morning, if, if we get the vote, if we win the vote, it's still, it's still not enough. What we need is an awakening. We need a spiritual awakening. We need a turning of our hearts back to the Lord, lest, like Josiah, within, within months of his death, the nation once again declines into the absolute depths of depravity. Nothing really changed, and God's judgment fell. Such a reformation can only begin with grieved hearts and a renewed obedience and humbled prayers and genuine worship. And in all of this, should we neglect the Word of God? Should divine truth be lost in the roar of politics? Then our house will surely fall. And our message will not be heard. And that's a tragedy. And Josiah on hearing the word of the Lord, tore his clothes. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. And I will heal their land. Isn't that what we're longing for? To see God heal our land? Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, how in the world can God heal our land if we will not be obedient to the call to prayer? To humble ourselves before God and pray. If my people if my people will humble themselves and pray. May God open our eyes to the fact that there is no new thing going on out there. There is no new history. There is no new day. There is no new sin or new righteousness. It's all recorded there for us in the book. And if with broken hearts we'll read the book, God will hear the cry of our hearts and He'll help us to navigate in difficult times. If we're looking to the book to fashion some kind of, pl of, of club so that we can go out there and win, then our hearts are as corrupt as our adversaries. If my people will humble themselves and pray. I know of no other way to close this service this morning except to challenge you to pray starts everything starts there and until we've prayed nothing's been done it doesn't matter what you organize it doesn't matter if you start your own party god bless you and god help you but until you've prayed you've done nothing you can say, well, I'm going to go sign up and I'm going to have a petition. And you, you can launch your petition and you can get a billion votes. And until you've prayed, you've done nothing. You've done nothing. It starts, it always starts. Whatever God will do in us, whatever God will do through us, it starts with prayer. And so I'm going to ask you to join me this morning and to pray for our nation and to pray that God would guard our own hearts pray for the wisdom of God and to pray for just the power to seek Him in love. For dealing with some of you, or you're dealing with this issue within the context of your family, or you're dealing with this issue within the context of your work, or you're dealing with, not if it's not this one, it's some, it's, it's some other issue, but you're, you're dealing with the impact of, of sin in your world, and it's, it's, rocking your, it's rocking your world, and you're looking for a, a book. Somebody's going to write a book. It's going to be published. It's going to come out next week. And oh, it's going to be a great book. And it's going to really help you. And you need to pray. You need to pray. Everything starts with prayer. And until we've prayed, we've done nothing at all. And so I ask you, brothers and sisters, join me as we seek the Lord this morning. We'll have no formal dismissal. This becomes a house of prayer. When you're done praying, may God richly bless your life. Walk with Him and share the love of Jesus everywhere.
But let's make this a house of prayer this morning.